call him in the morning, Jesus promised that he'll take care of me. That's so those are some reassuring words. I welcome everybody. This is Pastor Green. Welcome to our Sunday morning worship service. We're so elated to have you with us this morning. Uh, our scripture that was read from uh, the Gospel of St. Luke, uh, we are coming, we finally made it to this 17th chapter. We've been uh, on this journey for the last 18 months through the Gospel of Luke, and we finally made it to the 17th chapter. Uh, and the title of our message today is Four Hallmarks of a True Disciple. Uh, we're going to just start out with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to stand before your people once again. So we ask you right now for preaching power. Hide old green behind the cross and allow your word to go forth with power and clarity that somebody might be lifted up, that someone may be changed, that someone may be convinced that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, that someone might be saved. So we thank you, we praise you, and we ask it all in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. I said, yeah, you know, we've been on this journey now for 18 months, and, and, and we finally got into <coughs> this 17th verse. Now, 17 chapter, excuse me. Uh, uh, we've gone through the life of Jesus from his birth in Bethlehem uh, all the way through uh, his God fashioned for himself a human body, coming down through 42 generations from Adam through the line of Abraham, as promised by the scripture, uh, through the line of David, also as promised by the scripture, to bring into this world a savior, uh, who would a man who would uh, save us from our sins. A uh, scripture tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, and, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among men. Now that was the description of the incarnation recorded by John in his gospel. But Dr. Luke gives us a different perspective on Jesus. Uh, Dr. Luke, who, his scholarship and dedication to historical accuracy is without peer. And, and, and he traced uh, uh, what he wanted to do uh, when what John did. John painted the picture of Jesus. He wanted to show his deity, that God became a man. Now, what Dr. Luke wanted to do was not to, he, he wanted to make sure that we understood that although Jesus was fully God, he was also fully man. He wanted to highlight his humanity. So he brings us all the way through his infancy. And he brings us to the, the scene that began probably around the age of, of 27 to 28. So that by the time his his date with destiny would occur, he would be at the age of 30. So he, he the, uh, uh, the law states that a high priest must be 30 years of age. So the works of Jesus included the great high priest. So he, but he could not be a high priest until age of 30. That's why we had all those years of, uh, of silence on the life of Jesus. See, Luke gave us glimpses when he was, when he was born in Bethlehem. Uh, Luke gave us a, another story, y'all remember in chapter 2, when he showed up at the temple uh, and uh, he was lost for a couple of days and uh, well, he knew where it was, but his parents didn't. And they found him at the temple uh, questioning the doctors and the lawyers. But then after from age 12 on, there was this gap. Well, the gap was because the, 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 he could not do, the work would not start until age 30. So he had to be 30 years of age before he, can, before he would qualify as our great high priest 
and the great sacrifice. So Luke gathered his material from interviews with those who were who had firsthand eyewitness testimony. And, 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 and so and quite frankly, the church, us, we've been greatly blessed by Luke's account. Luke gave us something that nobody else gave us. He gave us a perspective that John did not give. He gave us a perspective that Matthew did not give. He gave us a perspective, a perspective that uh, Mark did not give. Now the events of the 17th chapter, they are part of the same narrative that began on that Sabbath day that set when uh, we preached on this um, in chapter 13, this is the same day, the same Sabbath, when Jesus healed a woman who had that, uh, who was afflicted. In fact, the title of the message was, uh, um, I, I think I, the, the exact title was uh, uh, Release from Affliction. Uh, Y'all remember Jesus said, Woman, thou art loose. And she came up. Satan had her bound, and, and, and Jesus loosed her from her affliction. And later on that same Sabbath, uh, Jesus was invited into the home of the Pharisee, and, and uh, the Pharisee just wanted to, in fact, he was the, the chief priest. And, and the chief priest invited him there on the Sabbath, and he had this man with dropsy there, knowing that Jesus was going to heal on the Sabbath. It's that same Sabbath, it's that same day. So, this is where we are, the same day. But here we are, those events. Uh, 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 the woman thou art loose was chapter 13. The man with dropsy, chapter 14. But here we are later in that same day with the same crowd. Jesus is still addressing his disciples, trying to teach them about the nature of the kingdom and entrance into the kingdom. Now, a, 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 the first chapters 2 to 11 basically uh, took up the first 30 years of Jesus' life. But chapters 12 through 24 comprise basically the last three months of Jesus' life. Now, a distinct timeline is practically impossible to establish in Luke's gospel because his purpose was to illustrate how Jesus was training of the twelve <coughs> and, and the twelve apostles and the other disciples that was going to carry on the work after he was gone. So his narratives were grouped according to topic rather than chronological, rather than purely chronological order. So an absolute timeline cannot be established. And any preacher that tells you that he has an absolute timeline going through the Gospel of Luke really is being irresponsible. You, I mean, he's, he's going somewhat chronological, but there are some events that I believe he just kind of plugs in because it makes sense. Because Jesus had, a, on, as we read through the Gospels, a lot of the things that are said in Luke you see in other Gospels. That's why they call them the synoptics. Jesus taught on these same areas over and over again. So you might hear the same thing. He's teaching on these same areas over and over again. So if, if, if Luke were to plug one of the conversations that may have happened uh, months ago into this, it's because it belongs right here with the context of, uh, of entering into the kingdom that the, the whole idea was, uh, this whole context was it requires humility to get into the kingdom. And what Jesus was doing, uh, uh, he, was, he, he was focusing on these principles as he taught his disciples. Now what has happened, uh, Jesus' public ministry was winding down and he was making his final journey to Jerusalem. The final journey. But he didn't go straight to Jerusalem. He just kind of meandered throughout the countryside. He was zigzagging across the countryside 
on his way to Jerusalem. He hit every little town. He go uh, sideways and he cross over and he cross over and he zigzagging. But he, he ultimately he's going to end up in Jerusalem. But all the little towns along the way, he hit them, teaching the message, teaching the gospel, trying to reach, trying to reach the, that last group. Everybody, he, he wants. He came to save the lost sheep of Israel. And he wanted to make sure that nobody was left out, that no community was over overlooked. All the while, he, as he travels, he continues to attract these massive crowds. Uh, and these crowds consisted of, of his disciples, of whom the 12 apostles are numbered, along with many more followers. Then there were these seekers, then there were these curiosity uh, 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 seekers, folk who just wanted to see him do another miracle. There were some who, who really wanted to know what he had to say. But there were some who were just, just curious. But then again, he also had his, his enemies were there, namely the scribes and the Pharisees. Now in this narrative, he is either addressing his disciples or the Pharisees. But, but, but as he addresses the Pharisees, he's still trying to teach his disciples. Although he may direct his attention to the Pharisees, and it's just to draw out a contrast between what a true disciple is and the Pharisees. The idea was he did not want his disciples to be like these Pharisees. So as he's teaching the, the disciples the principles of of walking with him, of obedience. He always stressed humility. And, and the problem with the, the scribes and the Pharisees, uh, there was nothing humble about them. They were an arrogant, proud bunch, that they, they were stiff necked, and, 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 and as far as they were concerned, uh, they didn't need to repent. Jesus' message of repentance. Uh, 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 in order to enter the kingdom was something they didn't want to hear because as far as they were concerned all they because they had the, the blood of Abraham in their veins that guaranteed them position in the kingdom and Jesus said no 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 it don't work like this you will either repent or you will perish oh, we get a message entitled that repent or perish well the, 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 the Pharisees didn't want to hear that they, for they were concerned, they were righteous. These self-righteous hypocrites, they, they, they were righteous in their eyes. But Jesus said, hey, on the outside you look like a white <coughs> sepulcher, but on the inside you're full of dead men's bones. So the Pharisees believed that they were guaranteed interest in the kingdom on the basis of Abrahamic women, rent lineage, and that's what they taught in the synagogues. And that's what they had the people believe in. And Jesus came on the scene teaching truth, letting them know that just because you are a child of Abraham, and he had given them plenty of examples, just because you are a child of Abraham don't stop you from going to hell. Everybody's going to stand before the judgment. And some folk going to be surprised. Y'all folk thinking that, that you can just get there on the basis of Abraham, Jesus said you got another thing coming. They were so blinded with their religious pride, they were convinced that Jesus was led by Satan and not them. Uh, uh, and so here they are, always butting heads with Jesus. So here we are in chapter 17. And Jesus is using the Pharisees as an example of what not to do to enter into the kingdom. And as we look at this these verses. Uh, we see in these first 10 verses four hallmarks of a true disciple. And I guess if I had an outline, uh, uh, the outline would, would, would read four hallmarks of a true disciple. Number one, <laughs> and this is what Jesus is teaching here, and we're going to look at these one at a time. But number one, a true disciple will refrain from causing offenses. Number two, a true disciple readily offers forgiveness. Number three, a true disciple recognizes his own weaknesses. 
And number four, a true disciple rejects unearned praise. So let's look at these four hallmarks of a true disciple and see how Jesus compares what a true disciple looks like and he's going to compare him with those, with those Pharisees. Now, uh, uh, Daisy, read verse one, 1 and 2 for me again. Then said he unto the disciples. Then said he unto the disciples. Go ahead. It is impossible, but that offense will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. He said, it's impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom, uh, whom they come. Keep reading, Daisy. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea that he should offend one of these little ones. He said it, it, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he'd be cast into the sea than he should offend one of these little ones. What does Jesus mean by offense in this instance? If you are in charge of somebody or you have somebody's ear or somebody's attention and what they learn from you cause them to stumble. If what they pick up from you cause them to end up in hell. If what they learn from you cause them to, 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 to thwart their spiritual growth. You can't be turning folk out. You can't be turning folk on to sin. Folk who were not normally engaged in sinful activity. But because they hanging out with you. That's what they're doing. He says, woe unto you. See, offense is going to come. Folks folk going to sin. <coughs> folks slip up. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's a fact. Nobody's perfect. All of us going to mess up. But don't you help them mess up. Don't you, and he's directing this to the Pharisees, don't you teach them stuff that's going to have them ending up in hell. See, everybody sins. You, you, look, 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 children, you get two little hungry babies in one bottle. One of them little babies is going to grab that bottle, going to drink all the milk, and, and when he get through, he might throw the empty bottle at the other baby. <laughs> See, you don't have to teach us how to sin. We born sinners. That's why Jesus Christ came into this world to save us from our sin. He sent the Holy Spirit to empower us so we can... We, <laughs> So sin will no longer have dominion over us. So all, everybody's going to sin. So he says, so it's important for Jesus that his followers conduct themselves in such a way that they always bring glory and honor to God and not themselves, which of course is the total opposite of the Pharisees. See, you see, refraining from offending others or causing others to sin or bring them into situations that, or where they make compromising choices what well, stuff always happens. See, and now the very presence of the scribes and the Pharisees were indicative of their, their penchant for casting stumbling blocks. Remember, they were on the down to catch Jesus say something or do something that they can use to, to accuse him. That's why they were there. They weren't there because they want to be lifted up. They weren't there because they wanted to learn something new. They weren't there because they, they uh, wanted to understand kingdom principles. They had their own idea of the kingdom, which was totally diametrically opposed to what Jesus was teaching. They weren't here to learn from Jesus. They were there to, to gather evidence against him. Now, uh, uh, um, now, unlike the others in the crowd, they were, all they wanted, and there were some who really just wanted to see another miracle. These jokers, they were bent on Jesus' destruction. They ignored all the evidence supporting his claim as Messiah. Uh, and and, and they, they invited him to meals on the Sabbath. We saw this a few times. They invited him to meals on the Sabbath <coughs> uh, just so they could catch him. All they wanted to do was accuse him of violating their traditions. So instead of praising God for the miraculous healings, they attributed his healing to the power of Satan. 
and then tried to convince all the people that, 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 that Jesus was operating on the power of Satan. So Jesus' lesson to his disciples was this. Don't aid. Don't abet. Don't encourage. Don't instigate the dubious actions of others. But you need to be the light that brings people out of darkness. And not only did Jesus teach the disciples to refrain, he said the true disciples must refrain from offending others or causing others to sin. Uh, true disciples have to be readily offer forgiveness. Uh, Daisy, read verses um, 3 and 4 for me. Take heed to yourselves. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. <coughs> but what? And if he repent, forgive him. But if he repent, forgive him. Now that's a hard thing for a lot of us. Impossible for the Pharisees. Read verse 4. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and of seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. The key is repent. See, we don't get to question somebody's repentance. We can't assume that because they slipped up again that they weren't sincere and they're repentant. <coughs> the Holy Spirit would not have instructed Luke to include the word repent because the repent was false. Thing is, some people are weaker than others. Uh, there are some folk who've been in addiction for a long time. There are some folk who've had habits and lifestyle issues a long time, and they might slip up. Uh, there are some folk who, who, you know, who just can't help themselves right now because they are, the Holy Spirit has not finished the work. He who has begun a good work in us will complete it by the time of Jesus Christ, but in the meantime, they still a mess. They still a mess right now. And we can't judge them. They're a mess right now. But we can't judge them. And, and when they and when they they, they cross us, <coughs> Jesus said, if they come to you and ask you to forgive them, you are required to forgive them. You don't have the, the right of the authority to question the sincerity of their repentance. <coughs> now that's hard for a lot of church folk. Because we like to judge people. Uh, we, we know how they are. You know, there's a reason why a lot of folk don't come to church. They love to say, because them folk at that church house. Time I was there, they was mean to me. The last time I was there, uh, uh, all day, I could hear them snickering in the background about how I used to smoke crack. I could hear them whispering in the background about how sharp my dress is. I, I could hear them whispering. I can see them make these rolling their eyes, and, and when I, they were walk out the church, ain't nobody uh, uh, greet me. Nobody said hello to me. Uh, they were not nice to me. See, Jesus says, if they ask you to forgive them, and he said here, if they, if they do it seven times, you got to forgive them seven times. That seemed kind of extreme, Jesus, don't he? He said, okay, well, that's still what Jesus did. Uh, read that fourth verse again from the days. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, turn and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Oh, look at him. I, I, just, I just want to make sure that, that my Bible wasn't the only one that said that. He said, what that means is, it, regardless of how many times they come to you expressing repentance, you got to accept it. That ain't easy. Even folk who done got your last nerve. Now I'm sure all of us running in our mind by some of the folk who qualify on that list. 
but these are Jesus' words, not mine. See, the true disciple readily forgives. <coughs> See, just what Jesus said in Mark 11, he said, Forgive if you have all against any, that your Father in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. See, a, a forgiving spirit is an absolute essential for kingdom entry. Uh, that in itself would have excluded the Pharisees who were notorious for their hardness of heart and unwillingness to forgive. See, uh, grace and mercy weren't part of their spiritual DNA. Only the letter of the law. They twisted the law to make themselves look good and make everybody else look bad. Uh, they, they, they wanted to make themselves look what we call holier than thou. They turned religiosity into an art form. And they paraded themselves before people as the paragons of virtue, uh, all the while lying in their pockets with the spoils of religion. Come on, y'all, somebody help me. You see, uh, commerce, politics, and religion were all interwoven into the system, and the system was controlled by the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. These are the folk who hated Jesus. And if you cross them, See, everything they did, they were relentlessly desiring to maintain their power and influence. And Jesus came onto the scene and he, he, he interrupted their, their grab for power. He, he disrupted their uh, accumulation of influence. Uh, Jesus was the one uh, 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 attracting the crowds. And, and they were there to make sure that the crowd didn't attach themselves too, uh, 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 too closely to Jesus. So if you cross them, now uh, Jesus say it, it, you, that in verse 3, if your brother trespasses against you, rebuke him. Well, guess what? The, the Pharisees, they were good on rebuke. But it was the forgiveness part that they couldn't handle. It's easy to rebuke somebody who messed up. But when they come to you asking you to forgive them, you need to forgive them. Until they mess up again. And they come back again and say, forgive me this time too. You supposed to do what? Y'all got quiet on me. I guess y'all don't agree with Jesus. You supposed to forgive. The true disciple he would be able to forgive because the Holy Spirit enables it. See, the true disciple of Jesus refrains from causing offenses. The true disciple of Jesus uh, 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 readily forgives. But thirdly, the true disciple recognizes his own weaknesses. Daisy, pick me up right there at verse 5. And the apostle said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. And the he said, uh, 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 Lord, increase our faith. Keep reading, David. Verse and the six. Lord said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you may say unto this sycamine. sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it shall obey so, so here it is. Now, this is one of those situations where I'm not sure if this interjection by the disciple is in chronological order to the Jesus narrative or if it was just placed here by Dr. Luke because it's germane to the context of humility. It belongs there, but it might not have been, this might not have been part of this conversation, but it might have been part of another conversation where he was teaching on the same thing. See, he was probably teaching on this. This came up in a conversation six months ago, a year ago, but, but, but Luke put it in right here because it it could easily belong right here because it's germane to the context. Nevertheless, Luke did put it there. Now, the apostle recognizes that there's something lacking within him. So he asked Jesus, Jesus, he, he, he know that <coughs> he don't believe his faith is sufficient to be able to do what Jesus is asking them to do. Remember now, Jesus said that, that you, you, you got to be able to forgive. Jesus said you can't be a stumbling block to folk. Uh, Jesus is giving them, uh, uh, he said, you got to be humble. You got to be repentant. Jesus is putting requirements on them that, uh, that's, that's hard from a human standpoint. But with God, what's impossible for man is possible with God. 
and, 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 and when we, we look at scripture, we look at Jesus. They got they they walking with Jesus every day. And they know that, oh man, I ain't nothing like Jesus. I want to be. I'm transformed. I'm being transformed day by day into the image of Jesus, but I ain't there yet. And, and, and Jesus is saying we need to, the true disciple recognizes where he is weak, recognizes his limitations. And, and everybody needs to recognize their limitations. So this apostle recognized that something is lacking with this hymn, in, in this case, namely faith, and he asked Jesus to give him some. Give him what he feels he's lacking. And, and, and Jesus points out, <coughs> and, and this is what all of us need to know. You think you don't have the faith to live the life of a true disciple, but Jesus is letting you know that the amount of the faith that it took to save you. Just the faith that it took to bring you to the realization that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, is all the amount of faith you need to accomplish anything that God will have you to do. Whatever we attempt to carry, whenever we attempt to carry out our earthly assignments, God will enable what he requires. And Jesus is reminding the apostle that the same anointing that saved him <coughs> is enough anointing to enable the assignment. As a believer, our inadequacy is a result of operating in the flesh or, engage, or in, engaging in an endeavor that God did not ordain. If it looked like you can't do something, that's probably because God didn't have you. You chose to do this, not God. You're not in your lane. If you're doing something that you know God wants you to do, he's going to empower you to do it. Now you need to go through the steps. You need to study your scripture. You need to pray. You need to fast. You need to engage in spiritually disciplined activities that will enhance your spirituality and that will enhance your witness, that will enhance your walk with Jesus. Sitting around and eating spiritual Twinkies all day is not going to do it. It's a metaphor. But studying scripture will. Having a, a disciplined prayer life will. Uh, going on an occasional fast so you can <coughs> starve your inner man uh, or starve your natural man and feed your inner man, the hidden man of the heart. You, you see, uh, 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 the problem with the scribes and the Pharisees that you, nobody ever saw a scribe or a Pharisee perform a miracle. And, and, and they can only operate in the flesh. That's what they did. They did that better than anybody. They turned it into an art form. But just what Jesus said in John 6, 63. He said, it is the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. I don't have a scripture up for that. Uh, it's the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The words that Jesus speak to us bring us life. <coughs> Unfortunately, the scribes, the Pharisees, they rejected the words of Jesus. So what they had was a dead religion. And their dead religion produced, produced dead results. So when Jesus spoke, this was the people's reaction. Never a man spake like this. Not as the scribes. So the point was, they had all the faith they needed. They just need to learn how to tap into the anointing. That's what we need to do, church. We need to learn how to tap into the anointing. How do we tap into the anointing? We do what Jesus did. We pray. We fast. We ask for it. We have not because we ask not. We have not because we ask not. This disciple said, Lord, increase my faith. Jesus said, you got enough faith. <coughs> he, he said, you got the faith as a grain of a mustard seed. And, and he used this analogy. If you can, you can say to the sycamine tree, be thou plucked into the sea and be planted, be, be, be plucked up by the root and planted in the sea. <coughs> and they go obey. Mm. 
This is a metaphor for letting him know, letting that apostle know that you have all the faith you need to do what I asked you to do. You just got to believe you can do it. You just need to believe that I'm going to believe the one who sent you. When you believe God's word, when you believe the words of Jesus, what the words of Jesus say about a situation, that's what you need to do. Don't doubt it. Anything that's not a faith is sin. See, the true disciple, he refrains from offending his brothers. The true disciple readily forgives his brothers. The true disciple recognizes his own weakness. And fourthly, the true disciple rejects unwarranted praise. Now, uh, Daisy, well, before we, before we have Daisy, let me, let me just share this with you. See, to teach the principle of rejecting unearned or unwarranted praise, Jesus interjects again and he uses a parable to illustrate this idea. Now, in the other parts of the conversation, he's just teaching directly. But now he uses another parable. And in this parable, in fact, it looks like it doesn't even belong there in this narrative. But it does. Uh, when we're looking at these four hallmarks, the, the, the four hallmarks refrain from causing uh, 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 offenses, uh, uh, readily offer forgiveness, recognize your own weakness, and rejecting unearned praise or unwarranted praise. Uh, Daisy, pick me up right there, verses 17, verses 7 through 10. And read this. Uh, this is this parable. I want y'all to see this. What, which of you having a servant crying, plowing, or feeding cattle, would say unto him, by and by, when he is come from the field, go and sit down to me. Now, okay, now, when you, the servant, he's on the clock, <coughs> and he get through with one assignment, and uh, it ain't time to knock off yet, but he, uh, would, you, would you tell him to go and sit down and eat? And he still got more work to do. Keep reading days in verse 8. And will not brothers say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me? Before you fix your plate, you need to fix mine. Don't get too comfortable. Keep reading days in. Till I have eaten and drunken, and afterwards thou shalt eat and drink. When I'm ready to knock y'all off, then you knock off. Then you relax. Keep reading, Daisy. Do he think that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I thought not. So likewise, you, when you have all done all things which are commanded, you say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. So, so let me kind of paraphrase those verses. Suppose one of your servants got, he's been working in the field, plowing and caring for the sheep, and he comes from work. <coughs> Would you say to him, sit down and eat? Of course not. Uh, what you say to that servant is to prepare something for me to eat, and then get ready and serve me. <coughs> and when I finish eating and drinking, then you can eat. See, the, the servant wouldn't get any special thanks for doing his job. That's the idea. This is your job. You don't get no special thanks for do, doing your job. What, what Jesus was trying to teach here, the expectation for a child of God is to conduct himself in such a way that when you do the things that you are supposed to do, there will be no blowing of horns. It is expected for a Christian to act like a, a Christian. A, a Christian is a definition of a, a, a disciple of Jesus. So he's to walk like Jesus walked. He's, a, he's expected to love his fellow man just as Jesus loved his fellow man. Uh, when a man goes to work and brings home his paycheck and he provides for the needs of his family, and doing so, he don't get a hero cookie for doing that. You're supposed to do that. You don't get a hero cookie for a late woman for changing your baby's diaper. You're supposed to do that. There's certain things that you're supposed to do. And when you do it, you don't get no 
praise for that. This is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to love your fellow man. Uh, I know sometimes it's hard. It's some folk who are irritated. It's some folk who are basket case. It's some folks who are needy and clingy and, and messy. And they come to you, though they may be needy and clingy and messy. Jesus said, as a Christian, you are supposed to deal with them as a Christian. Y'all got quiet over me. Jesus didn't, he wasn't trying to, uh, he said, I don't want y'all to be like the Pharisees. The Pharisees have kicked these folks to the curb. You, you know, this is what Jesus said about the Pharisees in John 8. John 8, 44 said, Ye are your, are your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. Uh, this is what he said in Mark uh, 12. Daisy, read from me, Mark 12, verses 38 through 40. Read that for me. And he said unto them in his doctrine, Beware of the scribe. He said, beware of the scribe. Now, he actually, this is actually part of Luke 20. When we get to Luke 20, we're going to see these same words again, but we ain't there yet. So I decided to use Mark. Go ahead. Which love to go in long clothing. They, they, they love to go in long clothing. And they, love salutations in the marketplace. And they love to vote so old rabbi, rabbi in the marketplace. They, they love to be seen. They, they, they long robes. Uh, they made sure that... Um, Y'all remember that TV show, uh, The Wire? Y'all remember The Wire? Remember that boy um, that had that big old hair, that, you know, the big old ball of hair? He is selling dope, and a, a rookie police could, um, could, could spot him amongst all the other children because he had this big old ball of hair. Y'all remember that, but I forget his name. Well, the, the Pharisees from a distance, you could spot a Pharisee because they had a big old hat. And they rode, with, used to float, they, they used to wear, walk around with robes that was about bad than Superman's cape. And they, 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 you, you knew a Pharisee from a, a hundred yards away. Oh, that's a Pharisee that I could tell by the way he dressed. And they did that on purpose, to bring attention to themselves. That's all they wanted was to do, was to bring attention to themselves, to, to make them look like there was something special about them in the eyes of God. Well, God thought they were, in fact, Jesus saw them and make, it, make Jesus want to throw up. But they were interested in impressing men. Uh, that's what David was talking about in the Sunday school lesson. Don't put all of your emphasis in trying to uh, 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 impress people. See, certain acts that we must do we do so for the glory of God, not man. And when we do those things, don't expect a, 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 a big old happy face from God. You're supposed to do it. <laughs> the problem is when you don't do it. When you don't do it, when you're not loving, when you're not forgiving, uh, when you're always causing other people problems, it brings a, a black eye on the name of Jesus. When you don't behave like a Christian and you walk around with that, that cross around your neck and you carry that big old Bible under your arm, all it does is it, it brings Jesus Christ shame. <coughs> you sully the name of Jesus. So if you're going to be that true disciple, See, everything the scribes would do, they, they made it look like uh, they wanted to be seen by men. Uh, whether the giving of alms, the public prayer, even fasting, uh, if you, you can read about it, I'm not going to go there, but if you read about it uh, in, in um, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, just go there on your own time. Uh, I don't want to ex extend this message out no longer. I'm getting hot and I'm, my head filling up with time. Um, but this is what Jesus said to him. You're going to have your reward. 
Jesus wanted his disciples to be authentic in their relationship with God and their fellow men. Uh, Jesus wanted his disciples to be completely different from the scribes and the Pharisees who walked around in their pride and hypocrisy. Uh, uh, Jesus wanted those in attendance in that audience to allow the Spirit of God to transform them on the inside out. Those who would surrender their lives to the Savior, repent of their sins, and ask for forgiveness, then they could enter into the kingdom of God. In doing so, it would be evident because when you did so, it would be easy to refrain from being a stumbling block. When you allow the spirit of the living God to, to take up residence in you, it would be easy to forgive those who come to you asking for it. When you allow the, the, the spirit of the living God to, to overrule in your life, uh, you, you can realize your shortcomings and recognize your own weaknesses. When you allow the spirit of the living God to take rule and, and, and abide in your, in your heart and over your life, uh, you, 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 you'll be able to, 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 to do the things. And, and, and when somebody try to pat you on the back for doing what you're supposed to do, uh, you can walk with humility and not pride. The problem with the Pharisees and the scribes was that they were a proud, a proud, prideful people, a prideful bunch. And then because of their pride, let me share something with you. As I get ready to close. Everything bad that happened to me in my life, I can trace back to one thing, pride. Everything, everything bad. Every opportunity that I missed, Pride. Your six things the Lord hate, no seven. The first one on that list is a proud look. Pride is a stumbling block to all of us. We can't let pride destroy us. See, it's a pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. Pride and haughtiness. That was the problem with the Pharisees. But when we allow Jesus Christ, we come to Jesus. See, Jesus knew that we didn't have, we, we, we had to recognize our own weaknesses, but we got to pray for God's strength. And we got to learn to tap into the power of the Holy Ghost. Well, we, we got to learn how to, to get the Holy Ghost power to, to, to rest, rule, and, and abide in us. <clears throat> and without the Holy Ghost power, without the Holy Ghost power empowering us, we, we like a, 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 a clinging symbol. We, we like a, without the Holy Ghost, we like an empty picture. Without the Holy Ghost, rest, rule, and abiding in us, we just make it a bunch of noise. Jesus Christ died on the cross to empower us to do what he asked us to do. And the only reason why we can't do it is because we either we don't have the power of the Holy Ghost because we were never saved or we never, and we never surrendered to that power. When Jesus died on that cross and they put him in that tomb and he stayed there for three days and three nights and he got up that Sunday morning with all power in his hand. He got up with the power to set us free. The power to give us deliverance over the thing that would have us bound. He gave us the power to do the task that God had instructed us to do. You either do it Jesus' way. Now I don't know about you. When I stand before the judgment. I want to hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Uh, I, you have been faithful over a little things. I'm going to make you rule over many things. What I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear the Lord say to me, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, because I never knew you. I want to hear those words, well done. So I'm going to keep preaching. I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep studying God's word. I'm going to keep equipping the saints for ministry. I'm going to keep doing what I got to do 
so that y'all get better. Father in heaven, I thank you. I thank you for the opportunity to stand before your people once again. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that those that are listening to the sound of my voice will develop those four hallmarks that are highlighted in these ten verses. The hallmarks of a true disciple. I pray right now in Jesus' name that you will give us what we need that you will allow your Holy Spirit to empower us to live out our lives that we can bring glory and honor to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're without a church home and you, 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 you want to be a part of this ministry, I want you to reach out to me. Uh, we can meet by messenger. Um, uh, if you need counseling or just want to talk, reach out to me. Reach out to the pastor, and I'd be glad to reach out to you. I'll meet you in your home. So just uh, contact me. My time is going to be, I'm actually on vacation, and uh, my time is going to be very, uh, you know, freed up going forward. So uh, where you might not have been able to reach me in the past, you will do going forward. So uh, we look forward to this next chapter in our lives. But Jesus is, is ready for people to get to work and, and do the things that he has caused us to do. Um, right now we're getting ready to uh, do the Lord's Supper. Actually, I've forgotten that today was first Sunday. Otherwise, I'd have a robe on. But I ain't want to look like a Pharisee. That's why I ain't wear it today. Because um, that's what they... <laughs> I kind of lost track this first Sunday, but I knew what the message was about. I didn't wear the robe, so, you know, those, those Pharisees, they like to bring attention to themselves, but uh, I'm not trying to be like them. Uh, Daisy's going to come, and she's going to read the scripture as we get ready for uh, our Holy Communion, and uh, those of you that want me to bring communion to you, just can send me a text message, and I'll, uh, I'll bring it to your house today. Daisy? received of the Lord, that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament and my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthy shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthy, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we do, we are chastising of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another and if any man hunger let him eat at home that he come not together unto condemnation and the rest will I set in order when I come we will pray to that the Lord will transform these common element into spiritual Father in heaven. We ask you right now that you will transform this, this bread and this wine, this fruit of the vine, that you will transform it from a, a natural use to a spiritual use. 
the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, eating all of it. This cup represents the blood of our Lord, drink ye all of it. They didn't have a, they didn't do a benediction on that day, they just went out on that mountain of olives and they went out to the world to do what God has commanded them to do. They did it without fanfare, they did it under persecution, under much affliction. We'll see y'all next time, we'll see y'all on Wednesday night at um, 725 and next Sunday as we are proceeding through the gospel of St. Luke. Chronologically, it's only about a week before the cross, but it might be Easter next year by the time we get there, because we're just in chapter 17 right now. So we'll see y'all next time. Now, those of you that want to give to the ministry, you may do so using the cash app, <laughs> dollar sign green WL. Father in heaven, bless these gifts, bless those who gave and those who had desire to give but had it not, and they may this offering be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. We'll see y'all next time.